as, as Bob mentioned, we're going to be starting a new series, Gospel, Community, and Mission. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of layering on top of the message that we had last week. So I'm going to put this up here. We started, we talked about... Rajiv, was that online? Rajiv, is that online last week's message? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Sorry, so that will be online. Yeah. Right. Who God is, right? And then we talked about what he did. Whoops. You know, I'm just as bad as Andy is. I'm going to use my fingers. Did who I am.
such as what you continue to have to do. It becomes centered around our activities rather than centered around God and his work for us and what Jesus has done. So, we must remember we are who we are because we are who we are because of what Jesus has done and is doing. Our being comes out of his doing. I am so sorry. Comes out of his doing and our doing proceeds out of our being in Christ. So, who I am, what God has done for us, who I am, because he did those, he, because he sent Jesus, because he accepted me, because he paid the penalty for sin, because of all of that, that affects what I do. Everything flows out of what God has done, not what I have done. All right? So, many people define the church by it. So, in this, some people mainly will define the church by what God has done, not also who he saved her to be. So all of a sudden, now you get a picture. If you leave out some of the other stuff, you can define church only by what God has done and stop there. But that's not it. That's not the whole gospel, all right? God did what he did because he wanted us, the church, to be and something else. And he saved us to do something. So in this case, if we just have the church defined as what he's done, all of a sudden, the place becomes a confessional. The people become confessional people primarily, but not an obedient people. Okay, so we'll come to church and we'll say, yes, I am such a sinner, and oh, I am so bad. But that stops. It stops right there. It never affects what we do if we only define the church as what God has done. So I want to lay this out here for you, and I want to say this. We need to define the church in light of, number one, who God is and what God has done. Number two, who he has made the church to be. And number three, what he has saved and created her to do. All right, so when we define what the church is and who the church is and what we're supposed to be, what should shape us, we need to define it by who God is and what God has done, who he's made the church to be, and what he has saved and created her to do. So let's think of this in family terms, all right, in familiar terms. Let's, do we define a church based upon what they do. So what we base the family upon, we are a family because we sleep in the same house, we eat, we eat food together, we do dishes and share a budget. Family then would be defined by their activities, right? Or by who they are. So a family, we are a family because we have the same parents, the same last name, belong to one another. Well, if we do that, then we're defined by our being. Okay. Or because how we came into being. We are a family because our parents gave birth to us or adopted us. And then we'd be defined by our origin, right? If that's how we define a family. So a healthy family would be defined in all of those areas, all three of those areas. One, our parents birthed us or adopted us, so we belong to them. Number two, we are related and share identity, so we belong to each other. And three, we do what families do together. Life lived together defined by love. So that would be the, that if we define the family, we have to define them in all three of those things. We're not just one or the other. So the same is true. Let's apply that to the church. All right? Because that's why we're talking. We're, what defines the church? The same is true. We are the church 
because the Father has made us his children through the life and work of Jesus, giving us new birth by his spirit. Number two, we have a new identity as children of God because of what he did, right? And number three, we live all our lives of love and good deeds because we are his children who are deeply loved. So you see how that kind of changes how we look at church, what the church is, what we are, who we are. We aren't defined by what we do. We are defined by what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And what we do then stems, flows out of that. Everything that we do flows out of what God has done through the work of Jesus Christ. And because of that, then we do, we're adopted into the family, and that changes how we do things. So, the church is God's people, who we are, saved by God's power, what he has done and is doing for us, for God's purposes, the good works he created us in Jesus Christ to do. So the gospel, the gospel message, the power of God. All right. So let's turn over, if you have your Bibles, I want us to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Here. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And I'll be reading out of the NIV today. I will be a good girl and read it so I don't get all sorts of extra things in there. But if you have another version, please read it. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what did verse 16 say? Verse 16 said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because what? It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So the starting point, the gospel message. We want to talk about that. So a full gospel-centered church, missional church, doesn't ask, well, you know, what works best for us? What works best? How are we going to do this? What works best for the people and the congregation? Instead, it asks, how do we fulfill what God, what Jesus has made our, his disciples to believe? So how do we fulfill the mission of Jesus to make disciples who believe and live out the gospel by displaying and declaring who God is and what he's done? in and through Jesus Christ, teaching and training others. That, does that kind of sound like Matthew chapter 28? So Matthew chapter 28 tells us what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Yeah, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. And it is verse 19. And 20. So the Great Commission, we'll start in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So, when we look at a full gospel-centered missional church, we're not supposed to be asking what works best. Well, should we have Sunday morning or Wednesday nights, and should we do Sunday nights, and well, what if we have this or what? It's not about what works best. It's really all about the Great Commission and what Jesus told us to do, to go into all the world and make disciples, training them and teaching them how to live the life that he's asked us to live. So our goal in church, brothers and sisters, is not to convert people to our church, to not to bring them into our church, although that's good and that's going to happen, but that's not our goal. Our goal in life, our goal is to see them converted and made into disciples to Jesus through the gospel so that they can be the church, right? So that they can be the church that he truly wants us to be. And through that, then we're going to be declaring what God has done. And in that, then displaying those things, right? We'll be declaring and de de declaring and demonstrating, showing people what the gospel is in life. Not just, okay, you have to come to church on Sunday. You know, all of those things that are good and they're true, but where's the motivation? Is the motivation out of who God is? Or is it because that's what I have to do so that I can be saved? so that I can be a Christian. And that's not what this is all about, brothers and sisters. It's not about that. So, when you look at the, the gospel, there are, two, there are two perspectives, and I have those listed on there, on your sheets. Two perspectives of how to look at the gospel. You can look at it, number one, thematically. Okay, you can read the Bible across the uh, you know theme from theme to theme to theme to theme across the grain. This means the means I have on, on our sheets. The means of salvation. Okay. And I've got bad, I have really got good penmanship, but I'm doing this, it's not so great. Okay, so the means of salvation, the gospel power. All right, now, I, it took me a while to, I had to look at this, and I had to put this into what this means. So when we look at this, we've got on there, on your notes, God, sin, Just put Jesus and faith. Thematically, when you look at the gospel across the grain, God, we became enemies of God because of what? Because of our sin. Right? And because of our sin, Jesus Christ came. Jesus came to pay the price for our sin. And how do we apply that? Through faith. Through faith. Okay. The means of salvation is Jesus, believing in what Jesus did for us. All right? Not by our works, not by anything that we've done. So I've got some scripture scriptures listed there. So we, the good news in this case, all right, the good news, the gospel, and that's what gospel means, good news. The good news is that God, in and through the work of Jesus Christ, in and through the work of Jesus Christ and his power of his spirit, accepts us and empowers us and is changing us. All right? By faith in what Jesus did for us, by following him, by being obedient. So, let me post this to you. In this way, there are three ways to look at what's going on in our lives. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. And we will be saved 
from the presence of sin because of God's power and work, not because of what I've done, not on our own. So the scriptures first, let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at um, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. There's that faith word. And it is not from yourselves, not because I go to church, not because I do good works, not because I do all these things. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. <clears throat> Bless you. Not by works so that no one can boast. And verse 10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So you can see here that we have been saved, not because of us, but because of what Jesus did. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at 27, 28, and 29. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, 28, and 29. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuous, strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Colossians is a great chapter. I mean, like, if you can start at verse 1, but for the sake of time, I can't go all the way back there. But if you look these verses up, it demonstrates the power of God in our lives and what he can do, for, uh, do through us. Let's just go over to chapter 2 and look at verse 6 and 7. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Hmm. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, there's that word, always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And the Amplified, it was really good in the Amplified. We're going to switch over here really quick. Okay, it's about this long in here. I mean, Therefore, my dear ones, now the reason what the Amplified does is it takes the Greek and the Hebrew and it amplifies, hence the name, amplifies some of the words that we may not catch quite all the power that's behind some of them. So therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, self-distrust, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. 13. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire.
desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Does that just add a little bit more power to it, expanding what the, the words mean? We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin and will be saved from the presence of sin because of God's power and work not because of what we do. And the last verse, let's look at 1 Peter. Verse 3 through 5. 1 Peter 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into the, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation, the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We've been saved. We are being saved and will be saved because of God's work not because of what we've done. So let me quote Luther here. Luther said that the first commandment is the gospel. You shall have no other gods before me. Is the same as saying this. You shall have no other justification for your life. Your righteousness, your significance, your security, Anything else that you want to put in there, except other than me. Let me say that again. You shall have no other justification for your life, your righteousness, your significance, your security, in anything else but me. That's where it all comes from. It's not because of anything that we do, but because of his power and because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? All right, so we can look at the gospel in two perspectives. The first one being thematically, right? The second one as a story. So we can look at the gospel as a story. So let me put this down here. Creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. So when we read the Bible, we look at the gospel, we can look at it in this way, the story. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. When we look at the, the gospel in this perspective, now we come to know the reason for salvation. Thematically, it's the means of salvation. As a story, this is the reason for salvation. So in this case, when we look at it, the good news is that God sent his son to redeem us to redeem the world and create a new humanity. Eventually the whole world will be renewed, right? That's what the word tells us. Death, decay, injustice, and suffering will all be removed. So he's going to create a new. God is saving the people and sending them out for his mission so that Christ will be glorified in all things. The church has been saved by God. The church has been saved by God's work for God's work. I'll say that again. The church has been saved by God's work and for God's work. So let's go back and let's look at these scriptures.
scriptures again. We're going to look. If you, I'm not going to read just for the sake of time. Ephesians chapter one talks about that, and then Ephesians two ten. We read that as well, right? Let's see. Verse ten says, "For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do." He knew from the very beginning. And then if we look at 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21, says this. I'm going to start verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Therefore, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Is that not wonderful? The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Think about that and what the job of an ambassador is. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's amazing. The gospel is not just about my happiness, about my individual needs. It's not even so much about God's plan for my life. And how many times have we heard, I just want to know what God's plan for my life is. Oh, well, that's good, and he's going to reveal that to you. That comes secondary. The gospel is not just about my individual happiness or God's plan for my life. It is, in these scriptures, it is about God's glory and his plan for the world. You see the difference of looking at what our job is? Are we looking at life and what we're doing as, indi as individuals and as the church? Are we doing things man-centered, what I think? Or am I looking at my, my purpose as what his plan is for the world? Totally different. Totally different view. So in this, God is doing something. And we His church, his body, have been called to his purposes. The people of God are participating within God's redemptive story. That's what we're participating in. His story. By doing this, by living out the gospel message, by living our lives out in front of the world, we are displaying 
God's redemptive work. We're showing everything before a world that doesn't know him on how we should live our lives and what, how much God loves us. We're participating in a mighty thing and we're offering a foretaste to the world of the future, what it's going to be like under God's rule. It's kind of like a trailer for a movie. They put that little teaser out there for us, and we would say, ooh, that looks really good. I think I want to see that movie. Right? How many have done that? I mean, I've seen, I've gone to see movies only because, you know, that trailer looks really good. Like, we still want to go see American Sniper, right? Only because we know the whole story, but the trailer and everything that's out there, everything that's being said about the different movies, our lives are the trailer and the foretaste of what God's plan is and what it's going to be like to live with him under God's rule. So you can look at Jeremiah chapter 29. When we look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 16, and Luke chapter 6, 20 through 36, which is the Beatitudes, right? That's just what it's going to be like to live under God's rule. And then let's look at 1 Peter. No, okay, so I'll give those to you again. Jeremiah chapter 29. And then Matthew chapter 5, 3 through 16. And Luke chapter 6, 20 through 36. Those are both the places where the Beatitudes are mentioned, where Jesus is preaching. And then 1 Peter. So let's turn over to 1 Peter. And we're going to look at chapter 2. Verses 9 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 through 12 says this. And this is cool. But you, all of us, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? It tells us right here that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now, and that's when we were, what, enemies of God because of sin in our life? Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, or the world, but the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Mm. Live your life out before the people. In uh, Genesis chapter, I think Genesis chapter 26, it talks about uh, building the wells. You know, and then he goes out and, and he then he goes to build here and he couldn't because he was contented with it. And he went here to build. And then he went over here and finally built this well. And they lived their lives out before the people that were around them. And because of their witness, because of the, uh, it was the children of Israel, their great witness before people, they gained such a good reputation. And they were able to share God's glory and what God had done for them. And the same is for us today. We declare and display the good work of God the redemptive work of God that he's, he's prepared for us. So let me ask you this. Whose story is it anyway? Whose story is it anyway? 
every one of us is a part of the story and is walking out this story in our lives before the world. Every single one of us. The real question is, whose story is it? We either see the story primarily as God's story, or what's the flip side? As our story. Okay? Our point of view is directly connected to our belief in the gospel. I want you to think about that. Our point of view is directly connected to our belief in the gospel. So, if it's God's story, we believe it is primarily God's story. Creation, he's the creator and the originator of all things. So, I exist because of him. If it's God's story, the fall, we rebel against him and his word stands. And if we believe that, then we really do die. Redemption. He saves us by his work and we put our faith in him to be saved by grace. If it's his story, restoration, he has work for us to do which he prepared and enabled us for. That's what the scriptures told us today when we looked at it. Now, if we believe it's our story, creation. <clears throat> I become what I actualize or determine to be. Therefore, I believe I am a God. If it's my story, the fall, I am good and others are not. Or, I am not good, but it's not my fault. It's because of some outside influence, or it's not because of my rebellion and sin. In this case, I am totally deceived and dishonest. If it's my story, redemption, it is through my work that I am saved, healed, made acceptable. I must perform. In this case, I, or someone else, I determine is saved. Restoration. I can fix me and this place if I will just work harder and more effectively. In this case, I am all wise and almighty. Can you see the difference between it being God's story or being our story? We can do nothing. Everything that we are is because of what he did for us. So we need both perspectives. We need both gospel's perspectives. We need to look at it thematically because we must know that the gospel means God, sin, Jesus Christ, and faith. We must know that. That has got to be the foundation. And we must also know that the gospel story is creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. When we look at both of those things as God's story together, when we see the gospel message and everything, Together, we see it synchronically and diachronically. So we see it in a full picture of how God really decided to lay this out. How he planned it out from the very beginning for us. We only focus on the gospel power. We don't know the gospel purpose. The storyline of how the gospel is to be lived out. If we only focus on the purpose, then we miss the gospel power, the work of God in Jesus Christ to save. So then we become, tend to do life as good works. We think that we have to earn everything. It has to be together when we look at the gospel, both perspectives. So, the gospel is God's work for God's work. The story is all about him. And it's not.
you learn anything, or is this, did everybody know this? Is anything new? Did you, anybody learn anything new? See, so when we, when we uh, in ministry, we always do this story. God sinned, we tell people about Jesus. You know, we're sinner, we all fell short of the glory of God. And then we tell them about Jesus, we tell them about the cross. And then you have to come to Christ through faith, again, through, through knowledge and research and all that stuff. Even though that can help you increase your faith, it's by faith that we believe this all happened. But, what, but we want to add to this because what happens, uh, and I do this, this is where I my stay. I always tell people, like new Christians, read, learn this, right? But then after they get done reading the book of John, they want to do, this happened recently, they want to go and start reading from Genesis all the way through Revelation, right? Is there anything wrong with that? It's not because people have a desire to know the whole story. They want to know about God the Creator. And well, how did man actually fall and all that stuff. And so we want to tell the story. So as we go forward, and I'll share more about this next week, we want to share this part with people too. Not just that they're sinners, right? There's something wrong with them. and they're, We want to know this is why God created the earth. This is why God created us for his fellowship and his enjoyment. He wants us as children. He loves it when the little kids dance around here on Sunday morning and we dance around in life trying to do our faith and, and, and believe and, and work our salvation out with fear and trust. God loves that. And so we want to share with people not only this part of it, because it's like I grew up in this in the in the gospel south, if you will. You know, we're all sinners. I mean, I mean, like I told you, my pastor even, you know, every morning on Sunday he would say, everybody's a sinner, and you're all going to hell, and, you know, everybody raise their hand and agree with that. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm past that. I'm like, God is, I'm his child. I'm, I, and that's the story part. I'm his child, and he redeemed it. And, and I learned more, and as I grew in my faith, I was like, yeah, I, can, I believe that I'm a sinner, but now because of what Jesus did, I might have a new life. And so, great, great message. Thank you. Tina for sharing. We're going to share more of this and more and more depth because we want you, we want to change our church life to a real gospel centered life as a family of, uh, of believers. But I, you know, even in our individual life, Tina and I are just like re examining everything like our finances and our building that we live in and, you know, our car and just how we do life because. We want Christ to be the center, of his story to be the center of our life more than our story. Amen? And that means maybe getting rid of some things. Uh, no, our desire. That song, Richard, was so awesome when you said our desire. Because my desire is like to have a new car, like the new Challenger, the new uh, uh, Dodge Challenger. Ah, man, that is a nice car. We drove by one yesterday. It's brand new. It's black. All you know, was no uh, salt on it. It was a beautiful car. And we're like, well, Tina and I are both like, that's the one, right? When we get a new car, that's the one we're gonna get. But then it's like, well, that's a you know, fifty thousand dollar car. <laughs> I could go to uh, Haiti, I could go to South America, I could go to China, I could go to a lot of places with $50,000. So maybe I just buy a $2,000 car that'll get me around town for a while. You know what I'm saying? So my, our desires, we know our desires are changing, but when we see that new car, both of us instantly go, woo! Yes, you know, so that's, but we want to change our story. We want to change why. Because why do we do that? Because we want, we want this to be centered of who we are. And I'm telling you, it's, we're changing too. I mean, we're changing. We want you guys to change with us, obviously, because it makes the purpose of what we're doing this for uh, even greater. I mean, let me tell you, to, act, to be able to share your story with somebody, how God redeemed you, is, is kind of the best thing you could ever do. And then when they, their life changes, when you see their life change and they accept Christ, you know, we had a... Um, a Chinese couple over for dinner last Saturday, and they were telling us their stories. That's why when we when we have people over, we want to know their story, and uh, and they want to know our story too because they want to know about how we became what we you know whatever our profession is. It's always a, that kind of thing. It's, it is cold in here, isn't it? Yeah. Did somebody check the heaters or we're almost it's check, let, go ahead and kick it up because it's, it's I, I'm even cold now. Um, but as we we're sharing just dinner with them. They were sharing their story, how they became professors and how they uh, did research and we know all that. But then the story began to change about, we didn't have to say anything. They brought
brought the Jesus up. And they brought how they knew about Jesus in China and how uh, their aunt was a Christian and a crazy Christian. And, and so then the story began to change and we get to share our story about how God changed our life. And we didn't get too detailed because it was just our first meeting with them, kind of uh, the per more personal. And you know, it takes time. It takes time. You can't just jump in. Um, uh, Deanna and Richard went sledding with some students, uh, professors, uh, and, uh, grad students, uh, law students uh, this weekend. But it's because of a really relationship with them. You get to know, they get to know their story, and, and they get to know that eventually, you know what's going to happen? They're going to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's a beautiful thing. God, and the songs, Richard, are, are in my heart. We, can we do those next week? Is that okay? Because that, that is like... Our, that message, that, those series of songs is the message God's put in my heart for this church. And I, I'm seeing us change, and I'm so happy for it. So anyway, um, I will talk all day about that. I'm excited. That our, I want you to go home, if you will, and reread the scripture verses that are on a piece of paper. And just let the Holy Spirit, uh, just let, him, let it just soak into your spirit on what um, is our purpose or what is God's purpose for us as a, as a congregation? And what is God's purpose for us, for you individually? Because it's, it's, it's going to match together, I think. Because our, our, our hearts are, are changing towards the village. That's why it broke, it broke my heart this week to have what happened on Friday. Because, uh, you know, it, these tragedies happen and it, 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 it hinders the love and the grace of God. But it gives us a chance to demonstrate God's grace and love also. All right? So if, as a church family, I'm not, I haven't talked to the board about this, so I'm just jumping out there. As a church family, there's other churches in town are doing this. If you'd like to give to this family for funeral expenses, um, write a check or something or give cash, give it to Dion. We'll make sure that money goes to that family, okay? Why? Because I want to demonstrate to that even though it's a tragedy, I'm not saying who's right or wrong. I'm just saying God loves you and here's a little help from us, okay? Is that all right? Demonstrate that love. Uh, so maybe that they'll come and, and know the full redemptive story of Jesus. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I just want to love them because if I lost a child, then I would be it would be tragic for me. Uh, no matter how it happened, it would just be a devastating thing. And so we don't need to judge that family right now. We just need to show love. Is that okay? Does everybody, everybody agree with me on that? Can, I'll say if you can give ten bucks, five bucks, or a thousand, whatever you give, just give it to Dion. Make sure that family gets it, okay? Um, so now, all right.